inhabited the Earth more than a million years before the dinosaurs. They exist in more varieties than any other animal group on the planet. There are 200 million of them for every one of us. They are insects. Most insects live above ground, but some live below it. They have adapted to every environment on Earth, from scorching deserts to snowy mountain slopes. Some insects even live underwater. From the tropics to the temperate zones, insects are everywhere. Yet because they're so small, they frequently go unnoticed as they go about their busy lives. In their own unobtrusive way, insects completely dominate the planet. They conquered land, water, and the air, and became perhaps the most successful animals in the history of the world. Human reaction to insects are as varied as the spectrum of insect life itself. Some we like and admire, as reflected in expressions like busy as a bee or cheerful as a cricket. Yet we find others so monstrous and repulsive that we cast them in horror movies as loathsome and despicable pests. On rare occasions, insects have even acquired a place in mythology. To the ancient Egyptians, the scarab beetle represented one of their most important gods. When it rolled a ball of dung along the ground, it reminded the Egyptians of their sun god Ra, who rolled the sun across the sky and renewed life. Thus the scarab beetle became sacred and even immortalized in jewelry carved from precious stones. But what exactly is an insect? Although various species of insects may look completely different at first glance, they all have three things in common. First, their bodies consist of three distinct parts, the head at one end, the abdomen at the other, and the thorax in the middle. Second, they are invertebrates. They have no backbone. Finally, all insects have six legs, and most have wings. These creepy creatures are often mistaken for insects, but look again. They have too many legs, the wrong shaped body, and no wings. Insects don't have internal skeletons, but most have a hard exoskeleton, which protects their inner organs, much like the panels which protect the inner workings of certain man-made bugs. Real beetles can't grow this big. Insects never grow very large because their exoskeletons would be too heavy to carry. Their breathing systems limit size, too. A network of branching tubes provides the body with oxygen by drawing in air through small holes called spiracles. Without lungs for pumping, air can't travel very far, so body length is limited to about six inches. The world's smallest insect can fly through the eye of a needle. Even this bulky goliath beetle can fly, though it's one of the world's largest insects. Large or small, all insects go back 300 million years when the first insects soared through the forest that covered the earth. Fossils show that some ancient dragonflies had wingspans of nearly two feet. Fossils also reveal that many early insects resembled modern day species, indicating that insects are an evolutionary success story. Insects had colonized the entire planet by the time Homo sapiens evolved, around 100,000 years ago. This event provided insects with a new opportunity. Many found they could adapt to live very comfortably alongside and all over humans. Bed bugs, fleas, and lice no doubt pestered our itchy ancestors in their warm, dark caves. Other insects, like cockroaches and flies, moved in to scavenge our leftover food. This made a rotten start to our relationship with insects, and ever since, we've seen them as no more than a nuisance and a pest, when in fact, they're vital to our survival. Without insects, it's likely we wouldn't have any fruit. Because fruit grows on plants which rely on insects, for pollination. 
About 100 million years ago, when flowering plants first appeared, insects quickly developed a taste for their nectar and pollen. As the insects fed, the plants were pollinated, the plants flourished, and the insects thrived in a process known as co-evolution. But not all insects are beneficial to plants, as we discovered when we began cultivating crops. Every year, insects destroy between 10 and 15 percent of the world's food supply, sometimes leaving entire populations destitute. And so the battle over limited resources has led to an ongoing war between humans and insects, a war that we sometimes seem to be losing. How can such small creatures compete so successfully against us? One reason is that they reproduce in vast numbers. Aphids, for example, reproduce asexually and can bear 50 genetically identical offspring each week. Predators see to it that not all of them survive. Most insects, however, reproduce sexually, producing several generations of genetically varied offspring each year. Genetic variety improves the odds on some individuals surviving and allows successive generations to adapt to environmental change. In a process called complete metamorphosis, eggs hatch into larvae, which look nothing like the winged parents. The larva grows and molts several times, finally becoming a pupa. Inside the pupa, the body is completely restructured, and eventually a winged adult emerges from the shell. The ability to adapt is the insect's key to success, and perhaps the most profound adaptation in the evolution of insects was the wing. Flight allows insects to cover large areas in search of food and a mate. It's also useful in escaping predators. The earliest flying insects had two pairs of independently moving wings. Later, insects evolved ways to link four wings to produce two flight surfaces that beat together. Some insects have only one pair of wings, which they flap many hundreds of times per second to stay aloft. A flock of birds may be worshipped, but insects are more often despised, as depicted in this South American painting of an insect demon attacking a long-necked bird. Insects are more loathed than lionized, more the source of superstition than the stuff of myth. One superstition dating back to 17th century England has it that the sinister sound of a death watch beetle is an omen of impending death. Another harbinger of doom is the death's head hawk moth, which gets its name from the pattern of the skull and crossbones on the thorax. In many cultures, butterflies and moths are associated with death, and both are seen to represent the soul of the dead as it leaves the body. Although most insects are land-loving creatures, the ability to fly took them to new habitats, like water. Dragonflies and damselflies adapted to the watery life and evolved one of the most curious mating rituals in the insect world. Having found his partner, the male literally gets attached and sweeps her off her six feet. After mating, these damselflies stay together to lay their eggs while on the wing or while taking a more leisurely dip. Here the couple submerges to place their eggs up to one foot below the surface of the water, and they do this for a very good reason. When the eggs hatch, the larva or nymph can take advantage of the abundant supply of aquatic food without competing with its parents. While here, the nymph shares its home with other water-dwelling insects, like this water beetle lava, which breathes by sucking in air through tubes in its tail. The water boatman stores air under its wings as it hangs upside down from the water's surface. This one is lying in wait for a snack. And this unfortunate hoverfly fits the bill nicely. It's pulled under to become the water boatman's next meal. Other insects have adapted to live on the water's surface rather than under it, like the pond skater, which uses its front legs to send signals in the form of ripples across the pond. Whirligig beetles rely on ripples, too, as a way to avoid collisions. 
While pond skaters and whirligig beetles live in the water on a permanent basis, the dragonfly larva is only a temporary resident. After two or three years of feeding, molting, and growing, the time has come for it to leave its underwater nursery. Both dragonflies and damselflies grow through a process we call incomplete metamorphosis, passing through a series of stages in which the nymphs become progressively more like the adults. Very young nymphs show no sign of wings, but with each molt, wing buds gradually develop, and finally, the winged adult emerges. As blood is pumped into the wings, they expand and lengthen. And just a few hours after leaving the water, the dragon is ready to fly. Dragonflies are hunters which rely on their huge compound eyes to find prey. Each eye has hundreds of facets. Each facet has two lenses that take in light and send signals along nerve fibers to the brain. Just what do insects see? It's thought that their compound eyes give a blurred image by comparison with what we see. We do know that bees and other insects are responsive to ultraviolet light, so their perception of color is different from our own. In the insect world, sources of food are color-coded. Flowers have evolved a clever means to attract bees and other pollinating insects. When we see this, Insects see bright colors guiding them to nectar. We don't notice the pollen in a flower, but to insects, it stands out like an orange beacon. It's also been suggested that insects process visual signals so quickly that our world seems to be in slow motion to them. One thing's for certain, insects see even the slightest of movements. That might explain why it's often difficult to swat a fly. While we may not know exactly what insects see, we know precisely how they sound. Aesop, the Greek fable writer, told the tale of the idle cricket singing a song while the industrious ant spent the summer preparing food for the winter ahead. But the cricket may not have been idle after all. Its call was either territorial warning or an attempt to attract a mate. The mole cricket's courtship song is one of the purest sounds in the insect world. It builds a Y-shaped burrow which fans out at the end like a gramophone's horn, amplifying its message. The tree cricket builds a sound system from a leaf. By vibrating its wings against the edges of the hole, the leaf becomes a natural amplifier for communicating. A male bush cricket rubs his wings together, making an ultrasonic buzz which attracts a mate. She hears this love song through ears on her knees of all places and sends an encouraging reply. Sound isn't the only way insects communicate. Some use chemicals called pheromones. That's how a male moth finds a date. His branched antennae covered in sensory hairs can detect a female's perfume from just a single molecule. The male flies upwind towards the greatest concentration of scent, which is being released from the female's abdomen. In this way, an Indian moon moth can locate a female from up to three miles away. Tent caterpillars also use chemicals to communicate leaving a scent trail to signal a source of food to others in the colony. Army ants cross vast areas of rainforest along specially scented pathways. The scents which mark the route are laid down by scouts to help guide the colony from camp to camp. These chemical highways also show which direction to go to find food which explains why you never get just one of those industrious little ants on a picnic. Having found a free meal, they quickly pass the message on, and soon everyone's arrived to join the party.
Ants, which are no more than a quarter of an inch long, can carry objects weighing more than themselves. But insects use chemicals for more than just communicating. They have also adapted them as defensive weapons. These wood ants are guarding their nest against invasion. If attacked, they respond with a jet of formic acid. Some birds know this and intentionally put the ants in their feathers where the acid acts like a de-louser, killing any other pests that may have hitched an uninvited ride. The bombardier beetle carries an assortment of chemicals for defense against even the most threatening predator mixing them at the appropriate moment into an explosion of hot, quinic acid. Not all insects do their fighting chemically. Male stag beetles use their menacing jaws to fight battles over territory. This Hemispherota beetle employs the hunker-down defense. When attacked, it pulls its hard shell tightly over itself. Using sticky pads on its feet, it protects its soft body parts from the ant's probing jaws. This beetle's larva has a different defense technique, camouflage. It covers its body in a straw-like nest made from its own dung. Some caterpillars disguise themselves as bird droppings and others match the plants they live on. Adult moths and butterflies often perform a similar trick. Markings on their wings match the leaves exactly. So predators find it hard to tell where dead leaf ends and butterfly begins. Also expert at adopting to and hiding in their environment are the stick insects. Their bodies are sculpted into plant-like shapes, perfect for hiding among the twigs, sticks, and branches where they live. Like soldiers camouflaged for war. The redcoats were far from camouflaged, but they relied on an insect, the cochineal beetle, to supply the scarlet dye for their uniform. And that same dye is used to color all sorts of food, from jello and candy to maraschino cherries and sodas. Even the icing on a ladybird-shaped cake. Whereas these bright colors are inviting to our eyes, in the animal world, they serve as a warning not to touch or taste. Predators know not to eat insects that are red and black, because these colors mean poison. Yellow and black also send a clear hands-off message to predators. And the yellow and black stripes warn everyone that this insect can inflict a painful sting. But stinging insects aren't all bad. According to folklore, bee venom cured Tsar Ivan the Terrible's terrible gout. Bees provide the perfect example of the paradoxical relationship insects have with humans. For despite the pain they can inflict, they also provide us with one of our oldest pleasures, honey. In some cultures, honey is a symbol of fruitfulness in love and marriage. But honey was also mentioned as an instrument of black magic in the records of a witch trial in Switzerland in 1499. Honey may not have magical powers, but for bees, it is essential food that keeps them going in winter and nourishes their grubs or larvae. Young insects spend most of their time feeding, and the greediest appetites belong to caterpillars, the larvae of butterflies and moths. They even start life by eating their own eggshells. Different insects have adapted so that their mouth parts suit their specific needs. Caterpillars have scissor-like jaws for cutting through leaves. They eat voraciously, and a single caterpillar can eat a whole leaf in a single day. 
Adult butterflies and moths have a proboscis, a long tubular mouth part for feeding on the sweet nectar of flowers. But they have a taste for salt too, and for other minerals. So they sometimes drink river water or from any source of moisture. Even the sweat on human skin provides some of the nutrients they need. Flies are equipped with sponge-like mouth parts, and they have the habit of spitting out powerful enzymes to digest their food before lapping it up. The assassin bug also uses enzymes to pre-digest its prey. With a rigid and powerful piercing mouth part, it spikes its prey, injects the enzymes, and then sucks out the contents like a buggy milkshake. The less than sanitary feeding habits of some insects are responsible for the spread of certain human diseases. The tsetse fly has needle-sharp mouth parts which can pierce human flesh. While sucking blood, they infect their victims with African sleeping sickness. Blood-sucking fleas were the carriers of bubonic plague, spreading the disease as they hopped from infected rats onto humans. During the 14th century, this plague killed roughly one quarter of the population of Europe. Perhaps it's the insect's reputation as a disease carrier that has led to our unshakable fear of them. Of course, the makers of horror movies haven't helped, but all things considered, insects are far more likely to destroy plant life than human life. For example, an army of leafcutter ants working together can destroy huge swaths of rainforest in a matter of days. With their scissor-like mouth parts, they can carry the leaves back from the canopy to their nests on the rainforest floor. In underground chambers, the ants cultivate a garden. It may look like chaos, but there is a meticulous order to what's going on here. The ants break the leaves into tiny pieces, creating a mulch. With added fertilizer from their droppings, this leaf litter nourishes the growth of a fungus on which the ants feed. Weaver ants use leaves to build their nests. They pull the leaf edges together, using their bodies like staples, gripping with their jaws and holding tight with their back feet. Then, using their living larvae like tubes of glue, they stick the leaves together. Ants, wasps, bees, and termites are all highly skilled architects. Some mix mud and water to make clay, and others chew up wood fibers with saliva to make paper, both techniques familiar to humans. These are social insects whose colonies have a great deal in common with human societies. Each individual has a specific job and all must cooperate in order for the community to function properly. Although humans claim to have built the first skyscrapers, termites were building them long before we appeared. This eight-foot chimney ventilates a sophisticated network of chambers and tunnels below the ground which house up to five million termites. On a human scale, this would be equal to a skyscraper nearly two miles high. How do they do it? Organization. Workers do the construction and forage for food, while the larger soldiers stand guard over them. At the center of this frenzy of activity is the most important member of the society, the queen, the only fertile female in the entire colony of five million. She spends her whole life inside a special chamber attended by drones, workers and soldiers. The reason she doesn't get out more is that she's too busy laying eggs, a total of 30,000 a day. All have their part to play in the survival of the colony.
such prodigious reproduction is one of the reasons insects are so successful. It also explains how they can be such pests. Some insects, like the Colorado beetle, consume our crops, reducing the harvest. Maize beetles and grain weevils infest our stored foods. And the ubiquitous cockroach invades our homes, contaminating all that it touches. We counterattack with deadly chemicals. But these chemicals must be constantly reformulated to keep up with insects which rapidly adapt to become pesticide resistant. And when pesticides do work, they kill the natural predators along with the pests. For example, rice farmers in Southeast Asia spray chemicals to kill destructive leaf hoppers, but the spraying also hits beetles and other insects, which normally eat leaf hoppers. And when that happens, any insects left will have a population explosion, defeating the original purpose of the pesticide. But the good that insects do far outweighs whatever problems they cause. For insects are among the world's great recyclers, converting dead animals and plants into essential nutrients which enable the Earth's soil to support further plant life. Insects are also indispensable as pollinators. The world we know could not exist without them. Perhaps humans might learn a few skills from insects, the planet's masters of survival. The Eyewitness Museum, created by combining traditional filmmaking techniques with state-of-the-art graphics, stripping away the mysteries of nature and science to reveal the essence of each subject. Bringing the world into sharp focus. The making of Eyewitness. The distinct style of the eyewitness books is the basis for each of the programs. Each half-hour episode is based on a book title. The eyewitness book's visual style gives the program makers a starting point and a challenge. The challenge of transferring the clarity and super-realism into moving images and sound. Now let's take a look behind the scenes at the making of Insect. To create our multiple image sequences in Insect and other eyewitness programs, images are used from many different sources. In the eyewitness video edit suite, the editor chooses and positions a particular insect. The shot is then color graded to match the white background perfectly, and then brought to life. Later in the show, we brought a caveman to life. But forgot to tell him that he would be sharing a shot with about 20 cockroaches.
strangely, only 19 found their way back into the box. The eyewitness team must be the only people who take their own ants to a picnic. These were leafcutter ants who made short work of a lettuce sandwich. To turn a beetle into a bug, we needed to combine a morph and 3D computer animation. First of all, we morphed the car into the body of the rhino beetle. Then we added the legs. The legs had to appear later as they would have spoiled the clean transition from the car's body to the beetles. The result gives us a car growing six legs and then turning into a beetle. The effect took around three days to execute. And in its final form lasts about four seconds.